So these notes are going to cover our part one of the Cold War, um, most of the early Cold War that's going to be happening in Europe, and then we'll move on to other areas of the world. So the vocabulary the area that you should focus on first is going to be the uh, containment is going to be our most important thing. And containment is the United States' whole plan to try and keep communism in the areas that it already is so it can't expand. We're going to go over the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan in depth, but I wanted you to have them here. But containment, you definitely have to understand. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, is going to be the democratic capitalist countries, military alliance led by the United States, and the Warsaw Pact is going to be the communist nations led by the Soviet Union. Some important people from the United States point is going to be Harry Truman, who's going to be president of the United States right after World War II, followed by Dwight Eisenhower, and then John F. Kennedy. And our two big people from the Soviet Union are going to be Nikita Khrushchev, who takes over once Stalin dies, and Leonid Brezhnev, who will take over after Nikita Khrushchev. So the Cold War starts right in 1945 at the end of World War II. And it's the Cold War is going to be the U.S. and its allies and the USSR and its allies. The difference between the Cold War and other wars that we have followed is the United States and the Soviet Union are not going to be able to actually fight each other. That's why they call it the Cold War. They're going to use other countries essentially to fight their war. So you can see from this map here, the Cold War roughly corresponds to where the different sides ended in World War II. So even though the Soviet Union and the Western allies made up of like Britain, France, United States were working together. They were friends because they hated Germany more. So if you've ever heard that thing, the uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend. That's why they were working together. And they tried to take as much territory away from the Nazis in Europe as possible because they both knew that communism and capitalism, the United States, Soviet Union, were never going to work together well. So they're trying to give themselves the best position they can in Europe for after World War II ends. They have very different goals for the world after World War II. The reason World War II is such a major event in, you, in world history is because Everything changes. Two new superpowers really evolve from it, and there's all these new organizations, and it gives birth to the modern world that we know. So the American goal is free elections for Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is those nations like Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, East Germany. They want free elections there. If the people want to be communist, they can be communist. But if they want to have a democratic capitalist society, they should be allowed to do that. Their number one goal, though, number one, is to protect democracy and capitalism. The Soviet Union is a dictatorship. Usually the communist nations that they spread to are going to be dictatorships, and that is a major threat to not only capitalism but democracy. So the United States comes up with this idea of containment. If a nation is already communist, they can stay communist. The United States and the allies will not try and flip them to de a democratic capitalist nation. But they aren't allowed to spread communism anywhere else. So they're trying to contain it. Think of it like quarantining. They're trying to quarantine a disease and keep it in the area that it already is. On the other side, the Soviet Union's goals are first and foremost to spread communism. They want to spread communism and actually overthrow the capitalist countries and make them communist. They want to get what's called satellite nations. So the Soviet Union has been invaded now twice, well, Russia, the Soviet Union has been invaded now twice by the Germans in two world wars and have suffered immensely from them. So they want to surround themselves with friendly, communist nations who will kind of protect them. So a satellite orbits a planet. It orbits around it. It's controlled by the planet. The Soviets want that. They want all the nations like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania to be communist and orbit the Soviet Union and be controlled by the Soviet Union so the Soviet Union can kind of insulate itself from other threats. They also want to resist Western imperialism. So they say like the European powers of Britain, France, Belgium, they're imperialistic. They're taking advantage of African and Asian nations. And they say that 
communism is the solution to getting rid of imperialism. So you can already see that the Americans and the Soviets' goals are very, very different. The Americans want to contain communism, the Soviets want to spread it, and that's going to immediately bring those two into conflict. So you can see here the differences between the communist countries and the democratic capitalist countries. Okay, In most communist countries, it is a dictatorship. Obviously, democracies, there's an election. The biggest difference here, communism and a market economy. This is going to drive the Cold War. So this is what the United States has. We've gone over this before where you decide what you want to buy, you decide what you want to make, how much you want to charge. In a command economy, the government decides all that for you. And that's going to drive the Cold War, this disagreement on how goods and services should be provided and sold to people. So as the Soviet Union began to push into Eastern Europe and push the Nazis back towards Germany, they began to put the communists in control of Eastern Europe. And at the end of World War II, stretching from 1945 to 1948, there were a lot of coups in these nations and the communists gained control and turned them into single party dictatorships. And the term for the divide in Europe between the communist nations and the democratic capitalist nations is going to be called the Iron Curtain. And it separates Europe into what's called two blocks. The Iron Curtain roughly ran where you're going to see the purple is down the spine of Europe. Yugoslavia is separate from it because Yugoslavia had its own communist dictatorship down here. But there's going to be the Eastern Bloc which is going to be the Soviet Union and all its little satellite states, and the Western Bloc, which is the democratic free nations, pretty much led by um, the United States. I realize I just put E here. That should be a W for West. And the Western Bloc here, which is pretty much going to be led by the United States. So Eastern, Soviets and its allies, Western, U.S. and its democratic allies. So the first real like conflict of the Cold War is going to be the Truman Doctrine, and this is based on the idea of containment. Remember, keeping communism where it already is, it can't spread outside of nations that already are communist. So in Greece and Turkey, if you look down here, Greece and Turkey were both facing communist rebellions that were supported by the USSR. So this like looming guy here, he represents the USSR. And the United States is allies with both Greece and Turkey and doesn't want them to fall to communism. So what the United States does with the Truman Doctrine is the U.S. says it will send military, economic aid, money, advisors, anything to any nation that is resisting communism. If you are fighting a communist rebellion, Uncle Sam, the United States, will send you a blank check for whatever you need to fight the communists. You can see that the Cold War is kind of viewed like a game of chess, like the United States is placing its pieces in Greece and Turkey to kind of keep the Soviet Union out as the Soviet Union looks to spread communism. The Truman Doctrine will be super successful in Greece and Turkey as both those nations will defeat their communist rebellions and go on to be democratic capitalist nations that are pretty much included in the United States' alliance. So that's kind of the whole point here is the United States and USSR are looking to get influence in other countries to kind of put their pieces in that area. So just to demonstrate containment, um, containment would say the countries that are communist, so the countries I'm going to circle in this light blue, the countries in red, are allowed to stay communist. If they are already communist, they can be communist. But they cannot try to export communism or send communists to change the other countries to communists. They're not allowed to do that. Communism has to be kept in these areas. And this is going to put the United States and the Soviet Union, obviously, at odds with each other because they have those very different goals throughout the entire Cold War. So think of the Cold War as kind of like a chess match between the two where they can't actually fight each other, but they're going to try and get as much influence throughout the world as they can. The next thing the United States does to practice this idea of containment is the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan is just an aid package for Europe. So Europe is totally destroyed in World War II. There's not enough food, there's not enough housing, and 
people begin to turn to communism. If your government cannot provide a person with, you know, enough food, a safe place to live, police, communism sounds really good because it says it's going to fix all that issues. But people who have, you know, a safe neighborhood to live in, they have food, they have a decent job, they have a car, they're not going to turn to communism because they already have the things they need. So the United States sees this and the idea is to rebuild Europe, A, because Europeans need help, but B, it will also reduce the communist influence in Europe. The Marshall Plan works wonderfully in the nations that get it. Communist influence drops. Those nations experience an economic explosion. The standard of living rises very quickly. The USSR sees this. They don't want communism to be hurt. So they counter with the Molotov plan, which is like the communist version of the Marshall Plan, and in, and they give it to Eastern Europe to spread communism into Eastern Europe. So the two nations, United States and USSR, are competing with their economies to try and get and win European countries almost over to their side. Germany was split after World War II into West Germany, which is democratic capitalist, and East Germany, which is controlled by the Soviets. But the Soviets and the Americans, basically being children at this time, also decide to split the German capital of Berlin into West Berlin, controlled by the French, the British, and the Americans, and East Berlin controlled by the Soviets. You can see here the issue is Berlin is in the East German area, which is controlled by the Soviets. The Soviets do not like this like outpost. So this area down here, this outpost of democracy in the middle of East Germany. So what they do one day is the USSR blockades Germany. They cut off the electricity, the water, all the food coming in, and their goal is to try and starve the Americans and the British and the French out of Berlin so that they will leave and the Soviets will have total control of Berlin. What the Allies do is they start the biggest airlift in history. So the Allies, since they can't drive their supplies in or bring them in by train, begin from West Germany and France airlifting supplies in to West Berlin. So all of the supplies the city needs are brought in by airplane. You can imagine that's a lot of stuff to supply a city by airplane. Um, this is a major victory for the Allies. And again, the Cold War is all about the United States or the Soviet Union looking better and trying to get more countries to like join their side. So the Allies are able to bring all this stuff in, all these consumer goods, all this coal to even run the electricity in West Berlin. And it, the Soviets eventually abandon the blockade and allow supplies to begin being brought back into West Berlin. And this makes the Soviets look really bad because the Allies showed that they could you know, supply a city just by the air. And it's kind of a defeat for the communist nations led by the Soviet Union. As the Cold War begins to be solidified, two alliances appear eventually. And those two alliances are going to be NATO and the Warsaw Pact. So NATO is formed in 1949, and it is all the Western nations led by the United States. And it's based on the idea of collective security. So all these nations in Europe are afraid that they will be attacked by the USSR. So the idea is they all come together, form a defensive alliance, where if one nation is attacked in NATO, it's an attack on all all the nations of NATO, and they'll all fight together. The Soviets are afraid of NATO, so in 1955, they force all their satellite nations to join the Warsaw Pact. And the Warsaw Pact is, has the same idea as NATO, it's a collective security, but it also has the hidden goal of keeping the satellite nations in line. So let's say that all of a sudden Czechoslovakia decides it doesn't want to be communist, the Soviet Union could then use the Warsaw Pact to invade Czechoslovakia and make sure it stays communist. You can see on this map here, okay, you have in this kind of like orangish color, this is all the Warsaw Pact nations, the NATO nations are in purple, and then obviously neutral nations are in green. But you can see the two alliances that are going to color most of Europe's history all the way through the 1990s. So like we talked about with the Berlin airlift, um, the Soviets controlled Eastern Europe and they there were a lot of people, especially from Germany, escaping into 
West Berlin because it was this little outpost of democracy. So all you had to do was run into West Berlin and say, oh, I'm a refugee from a communist nation. And of course, the Americans, the British, and the French are going to say, oh, yes, you are. You can defect to our side. You can come over to our side because that makes the communists look bad if everybody's trying to leave their nations. So what the Soviets do is they build quite literally a wall all the way around West Berlin. And the goal of the wall isn't to keep the people of West Berlin in. It's to keep the people of East Berlin and East Germany from getting into West Berlin. Um, they begin to use those the Warsaw Pact to put down rebellions. There's rebellions in Hungary and Prague against communist rule, but the Warsaw Pact troops and the USSR come in, they crush the rebellions to make sure those nations stay communist. Remember, the Soviet Union's goal is to build as many satellite nations around itself so it can never be attacked again like it was during World War II. So we're going to switch over now from Europe, and we're going to look all the way across the Atlantic to Cuba. So Cuba is only 90 miles from the United States, and it's going to be the next major flashpoint in the Cold War that's going to show all these um, conflicts of the United States and the Soviet Union fighting for influence. So in 1959, the guy in the top right-hand corner there, Fidel Castro, leads a rebellion and takes over Cuba. And that usually wouldn't be an issue, but... Cuba is only 90 miles from Florida, and Castro is a communist, and more than a communist, he's anti-American. He absolutely hates the United States. So automatically, he turns to the Soviet Union for help. And the Soviet Union, seeing that Cuba is only 90 miles from Florida, 90 miles from the United States, tells Castro, what do you want? We would love to have a base that close to the United States. That's obviously going to be an issue for the U.S., so the U.S., wanting to get rid of Castro and turn Cuba back to being democratic, launches the 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion. So there were a bunch of Cubans who ran from Cuba because they were afraid they would be killed by Castro. Castro is a brutal dictator. He executes people who disagree with his rule. And the United States begins training those people using the CIA, so the Central Intelligence Agency, to try and overthrow Castro. They land at an area called the Bay of Pigs, and it's an absolute failure. Castro knew about the invasion. His army crushes the exiles, executes a lot of them. And this really embarrasses the United States because Florida or Cuba continues to be communist. Because of this, the United States imposes an embargo on Cuba, meaning U.S. citizens can't go to Cuba, Cubans can't come to the United States, you can't sell anything to Cuba, you can't buy anything from Cuba, and we try and just seal Cuba off because it is a like now a communist haven in the Caribbean right across the United States. Castro... The United States tries to assassinate him a few times. We try to invade Cuba using the Bay of Pigs. So Castro is naturally afraid of the United States. So he turns to the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union offers him one of their new things, which is nuclear missiles. So the Soviets offer Castro nuclear weapons and says, we'll give you these nuclear weapons, which are very, very close to the United States, and the U.S. can't invade you anymore. The U.S. sees this as a threat and does this thing called quarantining Cuba. So what the United States does is we take our Navy and we basically make a line around Cuba. And we say, if the Soviet ships bringing missiles to Cuba cross this line, we're going to fire on those ships and we're going to sink them. Now, technically, the U.S. can't do a blockade of Cuba because they're not at war with Cuba but a quarantine is different. It's technically legal. Um, it gets very, very tense. This is actually the closest to the world gets the world gets to nuclear war. Um, you can see this kind of drawing at the top of the page where Khrushchev and Kennedy are sitting on nuclear weapons with their hands on the buttons. Everybody's afraid that there's going to be a nuclear war, but there's an agreement made behind uh, closed doors where the USSR removes all its missiles from Cuba, so they won't put any nuclear weapons in Cuba if the U.S. removes its missiles from Turkey. Turkey was about just as close to the USSR as Cuba was to the United States. USSR doesn't want nuclear missiles in Turkey, and the United States doesn't want missiles in Cuba, so they both agree to remove those missiles, and the U.S. says that it will not invade Cuba and try and flip Cuba from being communist to democratic. 
So again, this shows the idea that the United States and the Soviet Union, they can't fight each other because it'll be a nuclear war and it will quite literally destroy the entire planet. Billions of people will die. So they're using other nations as kind of pawns to try and fight each other. You can see here, this is um, how close Cuba was to the United States and it would literally put all the major cities in the United States in range of Soviet nuclear weapons. So it was a major threat to the U.S. But kind of that question at the bottom, um, was it hypocritical of the United States to oppose nuclear weapons in Cuba while the United States had nuclear weapons in Turkey and nations that kind of surrounded the USSR? So why these conflicts in Europe are going on in Cuba, the United States um, is expanding influence, its influence, just like the Soviet Union was. And the United States especially focuses on Japan. They don't want Japan to fall to communism. So Japan has to write a new constitution after World War II. They become a democracy. And one key thing is they completely disband their military. The Japanese do not have a military. They give up war. So the Japanese say that they will never fight another war, offensive war. They'll only fight to defend themselves. And the kind of the agreement is the United States becomes Japan's military. Uh, Japan falls under what's called the United States' nuclear umbrella. So the United States has its nuclear weapons, which will protect Japan and keep it safe. So Japan begins to host all these United States military bases. And if you see from this map, this is actually – the USSR. So by having all these bases in Japan, the United States is right on the USSR's borders and kind of like puts its chess piece in Asia. Um, Japan, with the United States' help, continues to grow all throughout the 1940s and 50s and actually becomes an economic superpower that is like a capitalist nation that can check China and the USSR over in Asia. The final thing we'll talk about is one of the most important, and it's the nuclear arms race. So as we all know, in 1945, the United States deployed the first nuclear weapon in history. Um, and for a while, the United States was the only one that had the atomic bomb, and it was kind of the ultimate check mark, ch checkmate against the Soviet Union. If you tried to attack the United States, the United States could just drop atomic bombs on your armies, and the war was over. But in 1949, the Soviet Union creates its own atomic bomb using secrets stolen from the United States and Britain with its spy network. And this immediately starts a nuclear arms race between the U.S. and USSR, where they race to build bigger, better, faster missiles, um, bombs that can wipe out entire cities. And it leads to the idea of MAD, or mutually assured destruction. And this is the only thing that kept the United States and the Soviet Union from actually fighting each other. And what the basic premise of MAD is if one side launches a nuclear strike on the other, the other side would launch its nuclear strike, and both would be entirely destroyed, and it would kill everything on the planet. And this is a very good incentive for these two sides not to go to war, because even if you get your nuclear weapons to launch first, your side is also going to be destroyed, so it's not worth it. And this will keep the United States and the Soviet Union in balance with each other for years. You can see here kind of the arms race and all the different developments that happened um, over the course of the war. Um, originally, it was just gravity bombs that were dropped from planes, but eventually they developed these things called ICBMs, which those are the big, you know, city killing missiles that have 20 nuclear warheads on them. Um, but it mad keeps them in check. They can't actually use these weapons or they will be totally destroyed. So I hope this helps with the early Cold War and some of the different areas of the world that the United States and the Soviet Union vied for influence. And if you have any questions, just let me know.